Hi friends and welcome to this week's episode. Last week I had a chance to sit down with my friend Dominique Saxa again on her podcast and was asked some really fascinating questions about menopause and midlife. So we're posting some of those here. I hope you enjoy them. I look forward to seeing you again next week. Since this is World Menopause Month, it kind of makes sense to start this podcast with our own menopause stories and journeys. And uh, don't, ours are, are kind of similar. But one story that I do want to share was, and this was my perimenopause journey. Mm -hmm. And I will never forget, Susan, I was such a great sleeper my whole life. And then suddenly, it's like this great saboteur came in and robbed me of the most precious gift. And I remembered I would struggle falling asleep. My mind would race. And then I would get up a few hours later and I'd have to go to the bathroom and then back to bed and my mind would race. And then I'm getting hot, blanket off, blanket on. And I, I just, it felt like years went by before I started to get some help in that arena. And it shocks me, A, I guess I didn't expect it when you sleep so well naturally mm -hmm. prior to perimenopause. But how long I went before I got real help to be able to get a good night's sleep. That is the worst. Insomnia, out of all the list of terrible things that happen to many yeah. of us in perimenopause and menopause, I agree with you. The not sleeping, I would probably put at the top of the list. Yes. It's a close contest. Hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, they were all up there. Yep. But prolonged nights of not sleeping literally make you crazy. crazy. I mean, they use it as a torture method, probably still do in some places. Yeah. If you don't sleep multiple nights in a row... We gain weight, we feel moody, we don't want to have sex, I want to eat sugar, yep. I definitely don't want to go to the gym, can't think clearly, brain fog. I mean, the list just goes on. It's horrible. Yeah. Uh, but the great news is we can sleep well in menopause. The sad part is we're not taught that this is even going to happen. I had the same thing happen to me mm -hmm. as a doctor. No idea that that was going to happen. Um one would think as a gynecologist, and we've talked about this before, yeah. that we would know what to expect and be experts in it. But no, no. We, we go through it too. I had no idea what was happening to me in my mid-40s. My office manager actually recommended that I check my hormones. Huh. I, <laughs> I thought I had the flu or something. <laughs> oh you, you don't notice it when it's like when you're a fish in water. I mean, you sort of don't yes. notice it when you're in it yourself, but your friends and family often yeah, are the ones who tell you. Something's wrong with you. Uh, right. You need to get it fixed <laughs> now. Right. Because yeah. I really thought I was losing my... I thought I was losing it. I mean, I actually did think that. Yes. I have some uh, sides of the family have some mental illness. I'm like, do I have bipolar disorder like sure. my uncle? Do I have Alzheimer's like my grandmother? It must be a brain tumor. It mm. couldn't just be hormone change. Hmm. But yet it was. And yet it was. Quite the surprise. Right. We are going to dive in. Susan, oh my gosh, we have so many questions from women from all over. So before we launch into their questions, and I love the fact that you're so open and receptive to, mm -hmm. you know, trying to answer other people's questions. I mean, yes, you are a doctor, but you're not prescriptive in this sense, right? You cannot prescribe a plan for people. Yes, of course. So I, without knowing anyone's history, I'm not making any specific medical advice for a individual. However, a lot of these things we share. So some very general things yes. apply to most of us. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. So good guidance coming. Mm -hmm. um, before we get going, I love to ask people how they plan on flourishing this week. Any thoughts on that? Oh, what a wonderful question. I am really excited about the importance of nutrition and movement in my life. So my week, I'm going to spend flourishing, eating healthy food and getting some good movement in every day. And that right. just helps me to feel better, helps me to sleep better, Yes, helps me to have my brain acting as well as it could. So I'm excited about exercising every day and eating some really yummy, healthy food. Good for you. And that's always been a part of your protocol. You know, you have run marathons, you have competed in all different kinds of things. And, and I know that that's what fuels you. And I'm so glad to see that it's a consistent pattern. And if there's a message for anybody is that once you dive into a healthy lifestyle, it's not a, a one-off, it's a way of life and you've made it so. And I've seen how it's really helped you in your life. And you can enjoy it too. I think yeah. so many of us are afraid of, or have a story like, I hate exercise or that healthy food sounds like eating cardboard. I eat really wonderful, delicious food yes. and I do workouts that I love mm -hmm. and you can too. Yeah. You don't have to do things you don't like. I don't recommend that at all. Enjoy no. every moment of your life. We, so. have, we have enough torture as it is. That's right. <laughs> yeah. don't, we don't, don't torture, torture yourself. yourself. Right. <laughs> exactly. No, have fun. Okay. Yeah. So we've got Courtney sitting off camera and she's got all 
all of the questions queued up for us. So Courtney, let her roll. Hi, Dominique and Dr. Susan. Dominique, I'm a big follower of yours. I really admired your mom and all the wisdom that she shared with us over the years on your YouTube videos. I'm actually from Ukraine, living in London, so it was great whenever your mom spoke about, you know, her family and how they moved to the United States, etc. My question with regards to menopause is, if you see hormonal fluctuations at an earlier age, I'm 31 right now, and I feel like, you know, my hormones are off. Sometimes blood work shows them being a bit off. Sometimes it's fine. But is it bad for my reproductive system if I will go on HRT? And is it possible to go on HRT without, you know, making your ovaries sort of be on pause and still produce the Excel every month? Thank you so much. Once again, have a nice day. Oh, how lovely. First of all, how neat to have mm. a viewer call in from the Ukraine. And, um, you know, my thoughts and prayers are with you and, and um, all that that country has been through. And, and mm. what a insightful, educated question. Yes. And what are your thoughts on that? Yes, that's a big question. I yeah. wish uh, she was here with me and I could talk to her for an hour about that. But oh, no. uh, short version, there's a huge range in what we experience as women when our ovaries start to change in hormonal production. So generally in our early 30s, we would still be fertile. We're still releasing eggs every month. So in a patient like that, assuming that that's how she's feeling or mm -hmm. your listeners who are a similar age, wouldn't recommend hormone replacement because you're still making estrogen progesterone, which we make after ovulation, and testosterone, which peaks around 25 or 30 for most of us and then declines. Mm -hmm. So for most women in their early 30s, would not be talking about hormone replacement, unless we're talking about something like birth control pills for right. preventing pregnancy. So nothing wrong with that, if that's uh, the wish of that particular individual. One thing I will say, if you check your hormones and you're still having periods, and this is something that happens all the time in my office, people will come in and they've had their blood drawn at some random time of the month. It's really important to understand that our hormones fluctuate during the month. So the standard time that we like to check hormones, if you're still having periods, is right in the beginning of the cycle. So during your period, maybe day three to five of your cycle would be the standard mm -hmm. because your estrogen could be quite low during your period and very high around ovulation. Right. So we want to make sure we know when we're checking it. So that's my main piece of advice. Always check your hormones at the right time of the cycle so that they can be evaluated appropriately to see possibly you are someone who's going through menopause earlier than average, but mm -hmm. checking at that time of the month is, is really important for your doctors to understand the results. Right. Does the birth control pill help with hormone regulation for somebody who's going through fluctuations? So when we're on birth control pills, we actually do not ovulate it. It makes our ovaries go into a temporary hibernation, mm -hmm. which is how it prevents pregnancy because right. we're not releasing eggs. So during the time we're on birth control, the hormones in our body are coming from that pill that we're taking. Right. Our ovaries are essentially not producing hormones. So that's great if we want birth control. It also can be quite useful to manage perimenopausal symptoms because mm -hmm. we're getting estrogen all the time in the form of the pill. Ah. So can be certain great uses for birth control pills. Nothing wrong with them at all. I took them for years myself. Right. Uh, but certainly something that we don't want to continue when we're, say, 50 or older. We yes. would transition into a different form of hormone replacement at that time that we can take for the rest of our lives. Mm. Great, great answer. Okay, our next question. Hi, I'm Shelly. I'm 56 years old. I love you both. I have a question. My birth mother, who I've recently found, was diagnosed with breast cancer. She carried the BRCA gene, and she was told that she was not supposed to take estrogen because it just feeds the cancer. Um, I think that she's given melanoma cancer to me and to my girls, and so I know that the, the gene continues down in our pool. And so I'm wondering your thoughts about that. My menopause is terrible. I've been going through it for about 15 years and looking for any kind of relief, and she said, do not take estrogen. Anyway, um, also, my doctor told me that estrogen makes you fat. Is that true? Tell me that it's not. Anyway, I love you guys. Thank you so much for doing this. Wow, that's... 
a multi-pronged question and, yes. and understandably the fear of having that genetic predisposition. But the yes. last part of the question really kind of caught my interest that estrogen makes you fat. Yeah. So interesting. Okay. So lots yeah. of exciting things to talk about there. Uh, also I'm 56, so we're in the same age yes. group. Uh, so most of your listeners know there are certain genes that increase our risk of breast cancer. Right. Uh, she mentioned the BRCA gene. I wasn't quite clear from the question if she has the gene herself. Uh, certainly if she does, that might change my answer a little bit. Uh, it's very controversial, as you know, yes. uh, about the whole question of estrogen and breast cancer. A uh, short version is in the biggest study ever done, which was published in 2002, now 21 years ago, mm -hmm. showed there was no increased risk in breast cancer in the patients who took estrogen. Now we know that if we have breast cancer, the common types of breast cancer do grow more quickly uh, when we have estrogen in our system. However, no studies ever shown, even in that case, that it increases the risk of death from breast cancer. So taking all of that information together, mm -hmm. I think it's really important to weigh the pros and cons. So breast cancer is terrible. I'm not suggesting that it's not. However, if we get a mammogram every year or if we have the BRCA gene, probably screening even twice a year, possibly even having a prophylactic mastectomy, there's a lot of ways we can manage that risk mm -hmm. so that we can take estrogen in order to improve our quality of life because we're weighing the risk of breast cancer against other risks like osteoporosis, cognitive decline, heart disease, feeling terrible, as she said. Yes. So in my opinion, and everyone may have a different opinion, I would rather feel great and get a mammogram twice a year, mm -hmm. catch the cancer early if I'm going to get it, and then and have a great quality of life, reduce my risk of those other diseases, which arguably are more likely to kill us. Mm -hmm. So not to make light of breast cancer, but we're much less likely to die from breast cancer than many other diseases that estrogen reduces the risk of, yes. not to mention feeling good is so critical. So the answer is not that you cannot take estrogen if you have the BRCA gene. That's not true. It's something to consider, but it's certainly not a hard no. The other question about estrogen causing weight gain, this is a natural hormone you've had your whole life. We're simply putting back what you've had since you were probably 12 years old. So no, estrogen does not make you gain weight unless it's given in doses that are too high. Too high, right. right. So uh, bioidentical estrogen replacement in the appropriate doses absolutely does not cause weight gain. It's right. a natural hormone you've had it all of your life. And the dosing that is used in midlife is far less than the estrogen we had in our 20s That's and right. 30s, right? That's right. I mean, how so, would you compare it in a, in a ratio? Yeah, so for example, if, uh, so I'm using estradiol right now. Estradiol is the primary estrogen that women make. So yep. we, we sometimes use those terms interchangeably, estrogen, estradiol, um, even though it's a little more complex than that. If you drew my blood today, my estradiol level would be something like 50. Uh, I feel great. My bones are healthy. Mm -hmm. Sex drive is great. All of the good things. Now, if we measured your blood when you were, say, 30 years old, around the time of ovulation, your estradiol might be 500. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly much, much higher when we're young and fertile. So we're putting back just enough to help us to feel well, to reduce our uh, risk of certain diseases, but certainly not as much as we had when we were young and fertile. Yeah. And I think I, so I'm so glad that you clarified that because I think oftentimes the misconception with HRT is that you're putting in so much hormone mm -hmm. that it's bringing you back to that time when you produced so much, but that's not the case at all. It's about no. mitigating the symptoms and preventing further disease, disease in right. other areas of your life. Yes. And you might remember, I certainly do. It, it, when I was young and fertile at times when my estrogen was very high and like around ovulation. Felt bloated. Yeah, I didn't feel good. Yeah. Right? We had breast tenderness, water retention, sure. moodiness. Uh, so having very high estrogen doesn't feel good. Right. Uh, and we don't need that much for all of the health benefits. So absolutely does not make, make you gain weight if you're given the appropriate amount for someone our age. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Susan. My name is Renee Campos. And I, my question is, I recently heard from a certified hormone specialist, um, Karen Martell, who explains that taking estradiol orally is not recommended, and also progesterone should not be taken daily, um, only partially with the estradiol. I've been taking uh, orally both for about a year, and I'm concerned about taking the estradiol. Could you please explain that? I appreciate it. Thank you. Another great question. Yeah, so um, I absolutely agree with... Uh, most of that advice. And just to say, uh, there's a lot of different uh, opinions and they're not right or wrong, but mm -hmm. I'll tell you my opinion, which uh, is based in science. Uh, taking estrogen by mouth increases the risk of blood clotting 
disorders, the type that can cause stroke, mm-hmm. tiny increase. So you could take estrogen in my mouth all of your life and 99% of the time you'd be fine. But because of that very small increase in blood clotting issues, the type that would cause a stroke, for example, we do recommend using estrogen in a non-oral form. That could be a patch, a cream, a pellet. So totally agree with that. Not to say you've done any harm by taking it by mouth so far. Mm -hmm. This is simply to reduce your risk going forward if you want to take it for the rest of your life. Now regarding progesterone, that is actually safe to take by mouth and it has this wonderful side effect of making you sleepy. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about insomnia and progesterone is a fantastic way to help with sleep, also reduces uterine cancer risk. Mm -hmm. Now for that reason, I take it every single day because I like to sleep well every day. Now there is an idea that if we're trying to use progesterone in a more physiologic way, like the way we produced it when we were younger, we only produced progesterone half of the month after Mm -hmm. ovulation. So another idea is to give progesterone just half of the month. Well, if that happens, you actually induce a period. So most of my patients don't want that. So Mm -hmm. actually it is fine to take progesterone every day. It's also fine to take it half of the month. I choose to take it every day because it helps me with sleep, but uh, your listeners could choose to take it either way that they prefer. Sure. And uh, what is it about taking estrogen orally that can increase the risk of a blood clot? Is it because it pro- it's processed by the liver? That's or right. Yeah. So uh, when we take anything by mouth, mm-hmm. uh, it goes, uh, takes what we call a first pass through the liver. And estrogen has a particular effect that it changes the blood clotting factors that are produced by the liver, mm-hmm. which is why we found that transdermal estrogen does not have that risk, which is quite amazing. Now, progesterone doesn't have that effect. So you can safely take that one by mouth. Mm -hmm. So it is quite interesting. uh, Absolutely okay to take it by mouth if you don't have any other option. Like some of your listeners who live in other countries might not have access to transdermal estrogen. But if we have all the choices in the world, yeah, the preference is to use it in a transdermal form. And that's what I do myself. Hi, I am not allowed to take hormone replacement due to a previous cancer diagnosis. What else can be done for me to help with no sexual desire? Thank you. Without the information about what type of cancer it was, I might just question that a little bit, the Mm -hmm. I'm not allowed statement. Um, And I appreciate that that's what uh, your listener has been told. I never approached it that way. I don't tell people what they can and cannot do. Mm -hmm. Certainly just give the pros and cons. It would be very unusual that I would tell a patient that they absolutely cannot take hormones. Uh, But let's just say this is a situation where the... uh, a uh, listener has chosen not to take estrogen. I think that's the hormone that she's probably talking about. Mm-hmm. Now, testosterone would be a very good option for sex drive. So many patients who have chosen not to take estrogen or maybe it's not a good time for them to take it, for example, if they're in the midst of being treated for breast cancer, mm-hmm. taking testosterone very rarely would be something that's not uh, allowed, so to speak. Uh, testosterone is fantastic for sex drive. It has a positive effect on breast cancer, meaning it doesn't stimulate the breast tissue. So if it's breast cancer that we're talking about, absolutely fine. Uh, so testosterone is fantastic for sex drive. Um, I would definitely look into that if I were in that situation. Right. And it's not only sex drive, but muscle, bone health, bone. muscle, breast cancer, I already mentioned, yes. sleep, yeah. energy, so many benefits. And if it's given in doses that are appropriate for a woman, and that is key, we don't see any risks associated with it at all. You know, aside from the different types of transdermal estrogen that we were talking about, um, there's vaginal as well, but that's a lower mm-hmm. dose, is it not? Yeah. So, uh, for example, on somebody who's been told they cannot take estrogen, I'll put that in quotation marks because I would always dig into that a little bit more. Sure. I already mentioned testosterone, but even a patient who's had breast cancer can use estrogen in the vagina in Mm -hmm. most cases, uh, because it's mostly bound locally. We see very little of it get above the waist. Mm -hmm. So for example, a breast cancer patient generally can use estrogen vaginally, and that helps with dryness, with pain within a course. And then of course, testosterone helps with that as well. And also with the sex drive, which is- which is what she specifically has about. Yeah, really so important. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hi, Dr. Susan and Dominique. My name is Kim, I'm calling from Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm calling to leave a message regarding menopause. I'm 58 years old and I gained the belly fat in the middle. Doesn't seem to matter what I eat, how I'm exercising. I cannot get rid of this darn middle tire. It's like on the upper part of my stomach too. So it's kind of strange. I've always been thin my whole life. So it's really, really upsetting me at this point. If you can help us with that answer, uh, 
I'd be so grateful. Have a wonderful day, and thank you so much, Dominique, for everything that you're doing. And thank you. Bye. Oh, thank you. That's that visceral belly mm. fat that we all talk about and yeah. get in midlife. So what's your strategy for so, that? So annoying. Yes. I, I told you sleep was like the, the most annoying. I think maybe we'll put that up there. Yes. It's like gaining fat around the middle. Yeah. When we go through menopause, uh, we do have a change in our metabolism. We become masterful at storing fat, yeah. which would have been a great idea in caveman days. I just <laughs> imagine back when we were ancient people, yeah. storing fat as we got older would have made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But that is a change that we definitely see and we can find a solution. So uh, I would have your doctor, if you haven't done so already, uh, check some hormones that might be not on their regular panel. For example, a fasting insulin level. It's very yes. common that we become insulin resistant. Is that A1C? Or uh, so actually, that's part of it. Okay. Yeah, so uh, if you did a full panel in my office, we would check a fasting insulin as well as, of course, a fasting glucose. Using those two numbers, we can calculate whether you have what's called insulin resistance. Now, uh, your listeners might know we make insulin in our pancreas, just right over here uh, to the left of our stomach, in a response to eating sugar and carbohydrates. But sometimes, and it can be genetic or just happen with age, we become resistant or insensitive to insulin. And with, with high circulating insulin levels, that is a fat storing hormone, makes it very difficult to lose weight. So that could definitely be the case. Now, what do we do about that? Mm -hmm. Nutrition and exercise. And I know she said she's doing all those things, but we can tweak it, like really limiting carbohydrates and sugar, increasing healthy lean protein, and strength training. So the best treatment for insulin resistance is strength training. That means you know lifting weights, sometimes maybe heavier than we have been taught to do in the past, and, and we can always make it work. Another thing is making sure we're checking your thyroid adequately because yes. that does control our metabolism. So really looking into your thyroid in detail, checking your free T3 T4. and free T4, mm -hmm. right? Not just the standard panel. Uh, all of that together, uh, if, we, if we do intense uh, lab work and look at that, we can always find a solution to get rid of that weight because I know mm -hmm. it's so frustrating. Uh, mostly the prescription is nutrition and exercise, but yeah. we just need to find the right combination yeah, that works oftentimes for you. Oftentimes there's no magic bullet to that. It is, it's, yeah. it's a tightening of the lifestyle. Yeah. That's what I have found over the years too. We talked about lack of sleep. When you don't sleep, you put oh, on weight. Right. Sleep, not sleeping elevates our cortisol. So yes. all of those things together are absolutely right. Yeah. And talking about tightening your lifestyle, you and I don't starve. We're not eating cardboard. Like I mentioned, we're eating no. wonderful food, but small changes like not eating two hours before bedtime, okay. limiting alcohol or getting or rid of it all together. alcohol. Right. So yeah. the, these small changes can make a big difference and absolutely we can get that to go away. Yep. That's good. Good to know. It mm -hmm. just, you got to dig a little harder, right? Dig, dig a little harder yeah. and it's not I don't, I don't buy this when your doctor might say, oh, well, it's just normal. No, it, yeah. no, you yeah. have the power. You That's just, right. you just have to work and tweak and figure it out. And then it's also not healthy. We don't, we don't like the way it looks in our clothes, uh, but it's also not healthy. Having that belly fat does increase the risk of diabetes, heart disease, even cognitive decline and Alzheimer's. So really important that we address it for cosmetic reasons, but also for longevity and having a long health span. Yeah. Great answer, Susan. Let's mm -hmm. carry on to the next question. Can't wait. Yeah. Yes, I currently take progesterone by prescription, uh, 200 milligram tablet, one time a day. And I also take the estradiol, which is um, a patch at 0, 0.375 milligrams a day. I was wondering, what, what hormone is it that? stops the um, hot flashing? Is it the progesterone or the estradiol? And if I were to stop taking um, these two, would the creams work to um, any better? Thank you. So that's actually a great combination. Yes. Um, so the estradiol patch mm -hmm. and progesterone by Capsule. mouth. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, that's what I prescribe for many patients. Mm -hmm. uh, so progesterone, 200 milligrams is a very common dose. That's what I take every single night and helps too. with sleep, yep. reduces uterine cancer risk, as we mentioned already. It's actually the estradiol that's responsible for getting rid of the hot flashes and night sweats. Mm -hmm. So 
0.375 is a commonly prescribed dose. Uh, the patch does come in several other doses. There's three higher doses than that. Oh, 0.75, 0.75, 75, and then one, one right? right? There's even a lower dose. Uh, but that's a very reasonable dose. So mm-hmm. with patches, we often say... Uh, if your symptoms are gone, you're on the right dose. Mm-hmm. You can also draw your blood if you want to, but that's not always so easy to do. Right. Uh, if you feel well and the hot flashes are gone, that's the right dose. I personally wouldn't switch to a cream. It's messy. It's sticky. It's difficult to administer. There's and isn't a, it inconsistent too? It's inconsistent. There's a lot of fluctuation. If we mm-hmm. think about our skin, uh, it's designed to be a barrier to things getting into our body. Mm-hmm. Now the patch, because we're wearing it 24 seven, we do get fairly even uh, absorption of that hormone. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with creams, it goes up very high and then drops down very low. If you've ever tried using it, it's sticky and messy, you have to dry your arms or I, I wouldn't switch personally. The other thing about progesterone is it's quite a large molecule. It does not absorb well through the skin. So that's why we recommend taking it by mouth. Ah. And it makes you sleepy. So if you're doing it during the day and you're absorbing enough to make any difference, it'll make you sleepy. So the amount that we need for uterine cancer prevention has only been studied in oral form. So I would definitely stick with taking it by mouth personally. Mm -hmm. I personally would not recommend creams that are difficult, sticky, messy, hard to do. Right. And for those who don't know, the patch is twice a week. Twice so you a week, get yeah. yourself on a system like a Sunday, yeah, Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Thursday yeah, yeah, Monday, or, Thursday. Right. It's quite easy to do. Yeah. Really sticky. So I used it for years. Uh, I was even swimming a lot when I was using mine and it very rarely came off. So that is a really nice option. Yeah. Uh, hormone pellets are another option for mm-hmm. women who want even more ease of use. You don't have to do anything for three months, Uh, but uh, just another option. It's not uh, better or worse, just another way to get it in your system in a non-aural form. As we talked about earlier, we ideally don't want to take it by mouth. Yeah. Great. Great answer. Next question. Hi, Dominique. Love you. This is Bethany. I had a question for Dr. Susan. I have hypothyroidism and I am going through perimenopause. I just wondered how the two played with each other or against each other or if there's more difficulties with this. Thank you. She sounds so cheery Mm -hmm. (laughs) for somebody dealing with hypothyroidism and perimenopause. So I appreciate her good spirit, but that's a, that's like a one, two punch, isn't it? Right. Well, so, you know, there's this idea in traditional medicine that, Uh, our bodies are somehow siloed into parts. Like you see a thyroid specialist and a gynecologist as Mm -hmm. if there's a wall in between those two things. Of course, there's not. When hormones change, they all affect each other. So we often do see as our uh, ovarian hormones are changing, getting into perimenopause, that if we've had low thyroid in the past, what we need now might be different than what we needed before Mm -hmm. uh, because things change. The other thing that happens is we're just getting older. So if we have low thyroid, chances are that might be continuing to decline. So absolutely needs to be looked at very carefully to make sure that thyroid's optimal as well as optimizing those ovarian hormones. So I think that's a really good example of when we when we talk about hormones, when people say, well, this, I'm talking about my hormones, what are we talking about exactly? Well, the ovarian hormones, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, but we don't want to forget about thyroid, insulin, yes. cortisol, other hormones that come from our adrenal glands. So all of them are important and absolutely, uh, we can't throw a pebble in a pond without creating ripples. Right. Um, Yeah, absolutely. It could be that your thyroid will change. I would just say it will Mm -hmm. as you get closer to menopause and your dose of medication might need to be adjusted. Here's a question I want to ask you. And I I feel that as women of this age, we really need to be our own best advocates Mm -hmm. when we go to the doctor. And you have listed off a variety of things that need to be checked. And so I Mm -hmm. think what happens sometimes is women will go to their doctor and they'll say, I need a full panel. Yeah. Now, what one doctor considers a full panel may be something very different than what you consider a full panel. So That's right. yeah. what, would, what would that list be of things that women should specifically ask for in their blood work? So your general practitioner is going to do a general wellness lab work, which is appropriate. So, uh, for example, if you come in fasting, we would check a lipid panel, cholesterol, and other related uh, lipids. Mm -hmm. Uh, What's called a complete metabolic panel, looking at your kidney and liver function. I would definitely recommend a complete thyroid panel. That's not just that TSH hormone, but also your free T3, free T4. I also check the very common antithyroid antibody that's associated with Hashimoto's disease Mm -hmm. because possibly as much as 50% of us will develop that at some point in our lives. And then, of course, the ovarian hormones, estradiol, progesterone, testosterone, 
Fasting insulin, I mentioned that already, that's mm -hmm. critical. And then looking at your blood sugar a little bit more closely. Also some common nutrients like vitamin D, vitamin B12. You can all do, also do more than that if you have the opportunity to do a full micronutrient panel. Mm -hmm. So based on those results, then we can dig even deeper if we see anything that's less than optimal. And yeah. I don't like using the word normal. Yes, thank you. Uh, but less than optimal because often the lab will read it as normal mm -hmm. when it's not Optimal, optimal for you. So we want to look at those numbers very critically. Now, one thing I didn't mention is cortisol. We do not want to check cortisol in your blood. It actually needs to be checked several times a day in the saliva or urine. So you can actually buy a home test to do that uh, because four to six times a day, that's difficult to do. Uh, coming into the doctor's office. Sure, sure, sure. So uh, drawing cortisol with a blood test is not useful, but you certainly can do that at home with a saliva test. Thorn makes a really good one, by the way. Yes, mm -hmm. and that's kind of the stress hormone, which that's I guess right. you need to check throughout the day as, as it's fluctuating. That's right, because it's supposed to fluctuate. We want it to be low mm -hmm. at night and high during the day. So one single measurement is not going to give us much information, especially a blood test. Mm -hmm. uh, but checking the saliva several times during the day, and um, I like Thorn's uh, stress test, which you can get on their website or on Amazon. And you can check it yourself at home, kind of see how that looks that's if you're interested. Right. And that's T-H-O-R-N-E, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Let's uh, go to our next question. Hello, this question is for Dr. Susan. Dr. Susan, do some women not experience menopause, in particular hot flashes is what I'm uh, zooming in on, um, because my mother never had them, my sisters never had them, and we'll see what happens in my life. But um, is there a possibility that some women do not experience hot flashes during menopause? And if so, what is the reason that some don't? What is the reason that some do experience it a lot more than others or, let's say, sooner and younger and longer in their lifetime or during that time period. Um, I hope that this makes all sense. Anyway, thank you. Such a great question. And can I just say lucky? Yes, very lucky. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> Let's just get that out right now. So, there is a subset of women who don't have hot flashes, but we still have to recognize that in the background, being hormone depleted is still causing those other potential issues like bone loss, mm -hmm. memory loss, loss of sexual function. But yes, if you're lucky enough not to have hot flashes, good for you. I've seen in my practice that's possibly 5 to 10% of women, so a small number. Now, why does that happen? That's a great question. We don't yeah. know. Our brains are all so different. Uh, there's a lot of uh, studies now looking at the fact that hot flashes are actually associated with Alzheimer's and cognitive decline. So those women who have more hot flashes have a higher risk of certain diseases mm. uh, related to the brain as they get older, which is why estrogen replacement is very helpful for those women. So yes, if you're lucky enough not to have hot flashes, I still would recommend hormone replacement because of all of the other benefits. And why? We don't know yet. The brain is very complex and differences between humans are just magnificent and yeah. curious. Yeah. It's, it's so interesting. Anytime I post about menopause, I'll mm -hmm. see in the comment thread that some women, women will say, I've never had hot flashes. Mm -hmm. I've never experienced any of these things, yeah. you know, and all the other women just pounce and they're like, Oh, if I could only be you, That's you know, right. it's, it's amazing. The disparity in, yeah. in what we experience and go through, but you're right mm -hmm. to, to each body her own. That's right. That's yeah. right. And yeah, hot flashes are horrible. You know, yes. I'd be so grateful if I never had them. <sighs> But I'm grateful in one way that I did have them, that it did encourage me to start on estrogen for all of the other benefits yes. that it provides. So yeah. I'm going to keep that in mind as right. well. So mm -hmm. you still encourage women who are asymptomatic in terms of men typical menopausal mm -hmm. symptoms, right, of what you would generally think yep. of, to still go in and get things looked at. Absolutely. Lots yeah. of other health benefits, even if you're not having hot flashes. Okay. Next question. Hi. Yes, this is Shirley Scott. And I was calling because I had uh, a complete hysterectomy because of endometriosis when I was in my early 40s and they couldn't put me on hormone replacement because they told me that if there was any endometriosis left in, in there that they, it would stimulate it. So my question to you is, I've seen a change in my skin and the elasticity of my skin and I just want to know what kind of things uh, 
protect my health uh, with not having my ovaries um, and not being put on hormone replacement therapy. Um, it kind of worries me. I am at higher risk for breast cancer. It does run in my family. So they also have told me it wouldn't be a good idea for me to go on hormone replacement. Um, could you tell me uh, what happens to your body after you have a complete hysterectomy and what I'm at risk for? Thank you. Bye. Yeah, so I would I would yeah. disagree with um, that treatment plan, uh, mm -hmm. not to criticize anyone else's management, because I can certainly understand where they're coming from, but there's certainly a middle ground there. Endometriosis, as uh, some of your listeners know, is a horrible disease where the lining tissue of the uterus starts growing outside the mm -hmm. uterus, so it can grow on the ovaries or even inside the abdomen and other places. So when we have to have surgery to remove our uterus and ovaries, our hormones go, if we're in our 40s, from being pretty robust to being zero overnight. Yeah. And that is a really tough thing to go through. Now, the idea that taking estrogen would cause the endometriosis to come back is not um, accurate. <laughs> so the current idea would be certainly to start on hormone replacement after that type of surgery. If the physician thought there was some endometriosis left behind, at the very most, taking a short break, like maybe three months, mm -hmm. and then starting back on it. Because endometriosis will completely go away during a short period of estrogen depletion. So at this point, more than a few months after the surgery, absolutely starting on hormone replacement would be totally fine. Mm -hmm. So endometriosis will completely disappear. It cannot survive without estrogen. Just like if your plants are dead, they're not going to come back. If you put water in it. That's right. So, <laughs> so at this point, you can certainly take hormone replacement. We've already talked about the breast cancer thing. Mm -hmm. People at higher risk of breast cancer certainly want to have a routine, regular screening, perhaps even more frequent than those who have an average risk, but not a reason to not take hormone replacement because of all of the other health benefits. Right. And so she was talking about the dry skin, which yeah. comes along in right. midlife. And, and that happens, you know, right. as we lose hormones. So for her, it must be exponential. But you're yeah. saying for her, maybe revisit yeah, so uh, when we've had, uh, and... yeah, taking out the ovaries when we're in our 40s is, is really, really tough. Yeah. Uh, and it's very unusual that we would not put that patient on hormone replacement. Mm -hmm. At the very most, taking a short break, like three months. Uh, if it were my patient, I would start her on it the very next day. Uh, but after now having a few months, I would certainly get on it and yeah. she'll feel dramatically better. Yeah. Anything topical that you recommend? I mean, I'm on HRT and I have dry crepey skin. It mm -hmm. runs on my, my mother had it and yeah. you know, everybody has it. So I feel like you just have to up the ante on yeah. retinols and hyaluronic acids and just use topicals as well to coincide and Absolutely. try to help things. So estrogen is so helpful, but does yeah. it reverse all of the effects of aging. No, no. I still struggle with dry skin. And yes. so I defer to my fantastic friend to tell me all the best moisturizer <laughs> products to use. Let me be I your know, guinea pig. But, um, <laughs> estrogen and testosterone are great for yes. our skin moisture. And then we're still facing the fact that we have aging skin and we want to right. add to that with topical products for sure. But yeah. uh, Estrogen and testosterone for me has dramatically improved my really dry skin. Mm -hmm. Testosterone especially, right? Yes. Because it increases yeah. the oil production in the, in the glands, correct? That's right. And that might sound scary because if you get too much, you could have excessively oily skin, even acne. So the, the dosing mm -hmm. is critical. Yeah. We want a little bit, but not, not too, too much. much. Right, right, right. right. That fine line. That's but right. it is. It's, yeah. you know, it's constant monitoring. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Our next question. Hello, Dominique. Hello, doctor. Um, my name is Linda. I live in Spring, Texas. And my question is um, in reference to menopause. Um, I'm, I'm recently 57 years old, and I probably had my last period at the age of 52, 53. Um, because I'm very active and I'm a fairly small person, I work out all the time, I run, I do strength training, I try to eat, you know, pretty healthy most of the time, and I drink lots of water. Um, I think all the phases that I went through was very mild and easy, if any at all. I wasn't having hot flashes or mood swings or any of that stuff. But I feel like since turning 57, I feel tired all the time, lack of energy, a lot of bloating. My stomach always feels like it's heavy and bloated and swollen. Um, 
and I'm just trying to figure out what I can do to ease all of that or to get rid of all of that. Um, yeah, so that's my question. How do I get rid of issues of being tired and lethargic and lack of energy and just the heavy feeling in my gut um, and the bloated feeling that I that I see and that I that I feel like is an unending thing in the last couple of months. Um, I appreciate your response and thank you so much for everything you guys do. Mm. Bye. Yeah, that's got to be frustrating for somebody who's mm. lived a very active, healthy lifestyle to all of a sudden see these changes. So take place. frustrating. And I'm yeah. so excited. So many good things that I'm hearing with the exercise and great yes. nutrition. Another thing, you live in spring, so you can come see me in person. You're right, she's And close. we can get all of this figured out. Uh, so come see me in my office. So uh, certainly without seeing a patient in person, I can't give specific advice because those symptoms could represent a lot of different things. Correct. However, uh, starting with the hormone panel that I mentioned and a physical exam. Mm. Uh, you know, bloating of the abdomen can be something physical that we need to address. Mm -hmm. uh, but hey, come see me. We're just down the road here in Tanglewood and in the medical center. Right. Uh, and so uh, being seen in person is critical. Yeah. Uh, so for general uh, terms, thyroid, uh, nutritional deficiencies, sugar abnormalities, mm -hmm. insulin resistance, all of these things can cause tiredness, not sleeping well. So many aspects that we could address that could be helpful. Right, right. And there mm -hmm. could be some underlying thing that she's unaware of. That's right. So yeah. that really detailed panel of blood work, anemia, yeah. iron deficiency. I can think of about 10 things off the top of my head, but we'd need to see you in person. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Hi, Dr. Susan. I had a question. I am 53 years old in menopause. Um, I've had a partial hysterectomy, and I'm on HRT. I take pellets with estrogen and testosterone, and I just added a few months ago oral progesterone. Um, just recently, I started having breast tenderness and swelling since starting the progesterone, and since I know that there's a link between the estrogen and progesterone therapy to breast cancer, should I be concerned? Um, and also, how often should I get blood work to check levels to make sure they um, are staying pretty balanced? I appreciate your time in answering these questions. Thank you. Great questions. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So um, I take all of that too. Uh, mm -hmm. So hormone pellets are great. I love them and I have them in my own body. Uh, my guess is the breast tenderness is not from the progesterone, but mm -hmm. from the estrogen. estrogen right. right. Uh, so pellet therapy, like, like we've talked about so many times, any type of hormone therapy has to be managed really carefully to make mm -hmm. sure the levels are not too high. 99.9% .9 of problems I see with patients on hormone replacement are because their levels are too high. Right. So my guess is in any patient who's having breast tenderness on any form of estrogen, it's because their estrogen's too high, not the progesterone most likely. Mm -hmm. Although that's a great cocktail, probably just adjusting the dose will be a valuable thing to do. So in my practice, and I, this should be standard, I think, uh, after you get your first pellet, we will generally check your hormones again in about six weeks, kind of see where you are. Mm -hmm. Now, if that level is appropriate, you don't have to do it every six weeks. Pellets last about three months, but at least a couple of times a year to see where you are. Or if you develop symptoms, that would be a great time to check your hormones. So right. if you have breast tenderness, I would absolutely check my patient's estrogen level and see if it's gotten too high. Now, regarding the breast cancer question, I wish breast cancer caused breast tenderness. It doesn't. It's silent. So breast tenderness is essentially never a sign of breast cancer. It's a sign of too much estrogen. Mm -hmm. so, so is that fibrocystic breasts or, or yeah, something the tenderness? Benign, right. So yeah. um, as we talked about, estrogen causes uh, water retention. It actually causes the breast tissue to proliferate well, yeah. in a benign manner, but it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It causes more blood flow to the breasts. And so I think you and I both experienced that where it's yes. like, oh, like you can't fit in your bra. It right. feels very uncomfortable. It's not dangerous. Uh, so not breast cancer. However, it's really uncomfortable and we don't want to experience that. So yeah. lowering your estrogen level is my guess about what would be the solution, but the way to know that would be to draw your blood. So I would definitely check it at least a couple of times a year. And if we're using pellets, we want to check right in the middle of the pellet cycle, mm -hmm. maybe about six weeks in, because that's where we're seeing, you know, where the level is going to sort of stay about stable. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great answer. 
And it seems to me your approach has always been, it's not just blood work, but it's blood work and how are you feeling? Right, exactly. I mean, really the most important thing is how are you feeling? Yeah. Uh, so certain patients might have a slightly higher estrogen level. For example, I mentioned I feel great when my estradiol level is around 50. I have other patients who feel great when theirs is around 70. Mm -hmm. So we really want to listen to what the patient's saying and what her symptoms are. If you have breast tenderness, your estradiol is too high. No matter what the number says, mm -hmm. I would drop it. Okay, great. Our next question. Hi, Dr. Susan. I'm so glad to have this time to talk with you and hear your ideas. My perimenopausal situation was horrible. I had severe nausea 24-7 and went from a size 12 to a size 4 in a year, and that was accompanied by severe excruciating breast pain and enlargement and pain throughout my arms. A complete hysterectomy in 2001 changed my life for the better. Since that time, I've been taking one milligram of estrogen daily. I've moved and my new provider is pretty insistent that I start tapering off to zero estrogen only because I'm 65 now. I'd love to hear your ideas and wisdom and research knowledge on the benefits and the perils of continuing estrogen after 65. Thanks so much. I am so glad somebody asked that mm -hmm. question. It was my hope because I think women seem to think there's a cutoff switch for yes, HRT. Yes, and a lot of doctors uh, uh, provide that information too, which is not based on any science at all. So uh, this could be a whole hour talk on its own. Absolutely. Uh, but the very brief answer is uh, being on one milligram of estradiol, and that's taken by mouth. That's a great idea. I would switch to a transdermal form, mm -hmm. but I absolutely wouldn't stop it. If we're thinking about why we're taking estrogen, and certainly in the beginning, it may be to mitigate hot flashes, night sweats. Sure, those may not be a problem anymore when we're 65, mm -hmm. but the risk of osteoporosis is starting to skyrocket. The risk of heart disease changes in our brain that can lead to cognitive decline. Yeah. So the worst time to stop it would be when the risk of those things is going up. The reason why some doctors still use that information is because of that study, the Women's Health Initiative mm -hmm. study. In that study, it only lasted five years. They looked at an older group of women. So arguably, we don't have data because no one's ever done a study looking at women aged 50 all the way up to end of life. That would kind of be impossible to do. So what we have to do is look backwards at women who've taken hormones long term. And what we do see is the science is supporting, unless you have other health issues, taking it forever. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the benefits for bone, heart, brain. So doctors will tell you that. And I, if you feel like being cheeky, you might ask them, what's the data supporting that I need to stop it when I'm 65? There isn't any. Mm -hmm. However, their argument might be, well, we don't have studies showing that it's safe to take long term. So it's yeah. a risk. <laughs> right. Yes. But, but, but the risk is minimal. And what, what the risks are, we know, are increase in osteoporosis, cognitive decline, heart disease, sexual dysfunction, sleep, all of the things we've talked about. So I would ask them, what are the risks that you're worried about? We, mm -hmm. It's hypothetical. So uh, I'm going to take mine forever. I would not stop it if you feel well. As you mentioned, your life was changed by starting on estradiol. Oh, yes. I don't want you to go backwards and feel like that again, yeah. but maybe switch to a patch or something transdermal yeah. and find another provider who might have a little bit uh, of a softer opinion about this. Um, mm. There's no rules that you have to stop it. Uh, that's mm. great. Now, she was already on it. I hear from a lot of women, so I'm going to interject a real quick question. Mm, a lot of women will mm. say, yes, am I too old to start? What's your thought on that? Yeah, so a different argument. Um, often people talk about this 10-year estrogen window. Yeah. Again, coming from data from the Women's Health Initiative study, uh, we get the most benefit when we start on estrogen early on, of mm -hmm. course, in the first five years, if possible. I think of it like putting money in a savings account. We get more benefit when we start earlier. Uh, because certain studies have shown that starting on hormones when we're older doesn't have those benefits, many doctors say you cannot start it when you're over X age, like for example, more than 10 years postmenopause. I take that on an individual case by case basis. For a very healthy woman, absolutely fine. Uh, now, if you're a smoker, 300 pounds, have heart disease, we'd want to take that into account too and address those issues first. So it's not a black and white no. Yeah. It's more like, let's look at your individual picture and make an educated decision together about whether you can start on hormones now and what the risks and benefits might be for you. Mm -hmm. 
because we're not a statistic. We're not the patient in that study. We're an individual. Right. Uh, so certainly in this patient's case, who's been on it all these years, I personally would absolutely stay on it, providing she doesn't have other health issues that I don't know about. But I'm staying on mine. Yeah, me too. <laughs> until I go into the grave. Exactly. Yes. Yeah, me too. Me too. And I think that speaks so much to just the importance of taking good care of yourself, because I mm. think you open up so many more options when you are healthy. Yeah. And, and just the individualization, I think, is so key. Yeah. I think any blanket statement, it can never be true. For example, no one can take hormones when they're over 65, or no one can start them when they're over 60. Mm -hmm. That cannot be true because we're all different. Now, Correct. certain people, that might be true, Yes, but we need to look at each person as an individual. I think one of the problems is that because traditional medicine allows so little time to evaluate each person as an individual and really look at her specific makeup, her specific risks, we're often not given that opportunity and we're just told no, which isn't what you deserve, in right. my opinion. Well, and that's why so many doctors and practitioners like yourself have left more traditional medicine, mm. you know, OB-GYNs, and have opened yeah. up wellness practices to be able to give women that opportunity to have that dialogue and get that information. So I applaud you and so many doctors mm -hmm. like you who are making that switch into this arena and doing it full time. And there are just women listening who are ever grateful for that. Yeah. Very yeah. rarely is there a black and white yes or no to anything. We have to look at the intricacies of each person and make an educated decision based on her yeah. life. Yeah. Thank you. I know we've got another question coming. Two more questions. Two more questions coming, yeah. says Courtney. <laughs> yes. My question for the menopause podcast with Dominique is what can you use for painful intercourse? My doctor suggested an estrogen cream. I don't know how much of a side effect there is in that. She wasn't very clear, um, and I thought I'd ask, what other options are there besides an estrogen cream that I can use that's more healthier for your body? Thank you. I'm struck by the fact that there's this link between estrogen cream being unhealthy. Yes, yes. And that, of course... Many of us are taught this, right? Our doctors tell us this. You know, we still have this idea that estrogen's unhealthy, which is so interesting because we've had it in our bodies all of our lives. It's a natural hormone. Right. So fascinating that somehow it became it vilified. Became, right? Yes, public enemy number one. The natural Why? hormones. So uh, I am in the camp who believes that uh, vaginal dryness, pain with intercourse, should be eradicated from the planet. No woman should ever have to suffer with that. It's 100% yeah. treatable. And it's such an easy thing to treat. So uh, the primary problem is lack of estrogen. So putting estradiol back is a great idea. Now, cream is a very good idea. It's a bit sticky and messy. It's hard to manage. Mm -hmm. But if you can manage it, that's a fantastic option. Um, estradiol is also available in a little tablet that dissolves in the vagina. It's, it's a little bit less messy. Same stuff. It's also available in a little ring that you can put in the vagina that mm -hmm. releases estradiol throughout the day. It actually lasts for three months. And then there are other non-estradiol products, not safer or better, just other ways just to go. Yeah. I really love the product Intra Rosa. We've mm -hmm. talked about before. Yeah. Intra Rosa is actually DHEA, which is a different hormone. It's pretty cool though, because DHEA is a precursor to testosterone, mm -hmm. which also converts into estradiol. So when you put uh, Intra Rosa, it's a little a suppository in the vagina, you get all three hormones. I think of that like miracle growth for yeah, your you vaginal put me tissue. On that. And I, yeah. I, can I thank you now? I haven't had a chance to thank you yet, but yeah. thank you for that. It, it's a really cool product. Yeah. It, it, it just provides the vagina with all of the, I think about gardening, with all of the nutrition that it needs, just like if you had a lemon tree, mm -hmm. you would use a miracle grow stick or fertilizer, <laughs> sun, I water. I think of it differently. Uh, right. <laughs> these, uh, these things that we need, right? Yeah. So our vaginal tissue needs estrogen. And you can use that in any of the forms that I mentioned. Now, if you were using estradiol throughout your system, for example, if you were wearing a patch or a pellet, you may not even need that. Uh, but if you do want to just use it topically, there's lots of options out there. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you, the idea that that's not safe or good. I think we just need to rethink that. Remember, you've had it all your life. It's very safe. It's very good. It you know, messy, sticky, difficult. I get that. So right. you may prefer a different delivery method. Mm -hmm. uh, but getting estradiol in the vagina somehow is great. So absolutely do it. Yeah. And like you said, the dosage is so much lower yeah, than what it we is. have had. Right. And we even if you have breast cancer, we, you can use vaginal estrogen because it stays below the waist, as right. I mentioned. Uh, you know, 
some exceptions to that, but finding the right product. And then there's other non-hormonal things like vaginal laser, which is fantastic oh, yeah. uh, for patients who you know really don't want to take hormones or even patients like me who I take hormones and I do vaginal laser because why not have more moisture and more sensation? I don't think you can have too much. Right. Uh, so vaginal laser is another really great option for women who just want a little bit more and or have uh, reasons not to use hormones. For example, if you actively have breast cancer right this moment, mm-hmm. um, other than that, uh, one of those products I think would be a fantastic idea. Great. Great. And uh, vaginal laser is what? Yeah, so there are different brand names. All of the laser manufacturers make one. I use one in my office called Juliet. Mm -hmm. Um, A wand that goes inside the vagina, kind of about the same size as a speculum if you're getting a pap smear. Uh, This particular one is an erbium laser. That's the heat source. It punches little holes in the tissue. It's not painful. Don't worry. Uh, And causing that intentional tissue damage, just like if you laser your face or any other body part, stimulates growth factors to come in and causes the tissue to... uh, become more healthy. So we see an improvement in moisture, even bladder function, sensation, because we're getting more blood flow Mm -hmm. uh, with vaginal laser, three treatments a month apart. It's really a cool thing to do. Now, estrogen's great by itself, but these are also things that you can do because you know what? I think for vaginal health, can't really have too much. Amen. And yeah. it's nice to know there are so many <laughs> right. accompaniments. <It's>, that's right. <laughs> right. More is better. Yeah. More is, bo- more uh, not is more. Usually, usually not, but for vaginal health, I think, I think yeah. that that's definitely a true statement. More yeah. is more. Love that. Okay. Last question. Hi, yes. Hi, doctor. My name is Haley, and I was wondering about um, menopause with, I wake up between two and three in the morning. And I was wondering if there's anything that I am eating or drinking to make my hot flashes um, worse um, to be waking up at that time. Um, they're pretty bad in my face and my chest when I get ice and um, I have a fan on me and all of that. But I was wondering if there's anything that I could do preventative um, for food or drinks. Thank you so much for blessing us uh, with your answers and help. Um, have a good day. Oh, I'm not a familiar story. Yes. <laughs> we were just talking about oh, that. Brings me back. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. In, insomnia uh, during this perimenopause menopause transition is horrible. You and I both have experienced it. And particularly the type that she's mentioning where you're so tired, you can fall asleep. Yep. And then I would wake up and just say, please, Lord, let it be at least 5 a.m. And it would be 1230. Yeah, 1230. And I'd be wide awake. Yep. It's awful. And so um, mitigating that is critical for not just for feeling better, but for long-term health. Mm -hmm. So I would say, first of all, get on estrogen. That'll make your hot flashes go away so they're not waking you up. Progesterone, we mentioned, helps with sleep, as does testosterone. And then other things that are healthy for sleep, I take magnesium at night. That's Mm -hmm. something that's very helpful. Most of us are magnesium deficient. There's a product that I love called Neuromag. It's made by a company called Designs for Health. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I also take a product they make called Insomnitol, which is a mixture of melatonin, 5-HTP, and some herbs, so some natural Mm -hmm. things, since we're talking about She was specifically asking about nutritional supplements. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then other things that are really important, two hours before bed, no sugar, no alcohol. Correct. No alcohol destroys deep sleep. It's a saboteur. I wear an Aura ring, Mm O-U-R-A. I really recommend this for anyone who struggles with sleep. If I drink alcohol or have sugar within two hours of bed, my deep sleep Mm -hmm. is affected. And I'll tell you, I do still try it. I'll see if I can trick the ring. Mm -hmm. She's always right. Every time I try it, I'm (laughs) like, dang it again. So it's like, it's an accountability partner. So I really love this thing. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I love now I get good scores in the morning. Uh, But your listener wearing the ring, just like me, would have had terrible sleep scores. And then seeing them improve with those lifestyle changes is so exciting. Yes. So now I get good sleep and I was the world's worst sleeper probably along with you. Oh, yes. Um, and now I'm not. So yes, we, we can learn how to sleep again. It's so important. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I feel uh, my heart goes out to you because I know that feeling of looking at the clock and like, I can't Ugh. do this one more night. It's right. awful. And then the heat. And then she Ugh. was saying, you know, she's red in the face and the chest. So you know, there's the physical symptoms are so powerful and so it, uncomfortable. Terrible. And, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier and there's some really interesting uh, data as recently as this week was reading another article about uh, hot flashes, not just being inconvenient, but they are associated, women who have more of them like me, mm-hmm. with cognitive decline as yes. we get older. So it's not just inconvenient. It also can be a factor that affects our health in the future. Right. So 
maybe think about estrogen and those other supplements can be very helpful too. Yeah. And I found just from my own personal experience, getting, getting sugar, dairy, and, and the inflammatory mm. foods out of the diet, like you said, the timing yeah. of everything, alcohol. And also you mentioned this at the beginning of the podcast, intense exercise, especially weight bearing, mm. heavy weight bearing exercise, yeah. fatiguing the body, you know, all of these things will help it to relax along with all the wonderful accompaniments that you just mentioned. But it's, it's, I feel like it's making a big pot of soup. It right? is. I talk about, I think it's like soup. Exactly. I love that analogy. We're, we're, we're doing all these things and each one of them might seem relatively minor yeah. as if you're making soup, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, right. but adding them together, yes. uh, we can create harmony again. And I love that idea of harmony so that our body is sort of singing and working as it should so that we're sleeping when it's dark, awake yeah. when it's light. I was the opposite. I felt like I had jet lag all the time, yep. sleeping at two o'clock in the afternoon, wide awake at two o'clock in the morning, yeah. but it can be corrected. So yeah, absolutely. Insomnia. Whew. Oof. Terrible. The worst. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for, for helping us make soup and yes. <laughs> giving us, um, and our viewers who asked, I thought such lovely, really good questions, really good yeah. questions, really good questions. Something tells me this will be kind of a continuing theme mm -hmm. with you. I mean, I, you know, I've flushed out all my questions with you. I've asked everything I think I can possibly ask of you, but I, I really want to help women who mm -hmm. have specific needs. And so I just thank you for taking the time and coming in and doing what you do. Well, it's my pleasure. And I want to just uh, honor the women who did send in questions. It's, it's such an act of generosity to do that because your yes. question help is others. thousands of other people's question as well. Yeah. And so, you know, those who are not is forward with asking questions are going to get great answers because you were generous enough to do that. So thank you so much. Yes. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Susan, once again, and I'll mm. see you soon. See you soon. Mm -hmm.